In this video, we're going to learn and practice assigning oxidation numbers and balancing redox reactions in acidic and basic solution. And this is a very important skill to develop before we dig into galvanic cells and electrolysis where we're applying redox reactions because it will help us see where and how oxidation and reduction are occurring within a full redox reaction. So let's get into this. So the first key skill is assigning oxidation number and we talked about some strategies for doing that in the last video. To assign oxidation numbers to all the elements in the following species, the first thing we need is a Lewis structure because we need to know what's bonded to what, what its formal charge is, and how many electrons it's got associated with it. So let's start by drawing Lewis structures for these three compounds. So H2S has the sulfur atom in the center and two hydrogens on the periphery. And there are two lone pairs on the sulfur atom, which are sort of optional. I'm going to omit lone pairs on most atoms in the remainder of this problem. In B, we have SO3 2 minus. This is the sulfite anion. That's got a sulfur at the center, the less electronegative atom, and the three oxygens around the outside. One of the oxygens has a double bond and two have single bonds. And the formal charge on those two singly bonded oxygens is negative one each. There's also a lone pair at the sulfur atom, which is important to recognize to see that that sulfur is formally neutral in this Lewis structure. Finally, in C, we have sodium sulfate, Na2SO4. Now, this is an ionic compound. It consists of a cationic sodium, sodium plus, and an anionic sulfate, SO4 two minus, and we've got two sodium cations to balance that negative two charge on sulfate. So to draw the Lewis structure, well, let's start by separating those ions and just writing two Na plus and SO4 two minus. And the Lewis structure for SO4 two minus is gonna be important to draw because it's a polyatomic anion. So now we have two SO double bonds and two SO single bonds, and as in sulfite, those oxygens with single bonds have a formal charge of negative one. And now, because of the extra oxygen, we lack a lone pair at sulfur, but it's still formally neutral. All right, now that we've got these Lewis structures down, let's apply the rules that we saw in the last video to assign oxidation number. And the general idea that to assign oxidation number, we split each covalent bond, giving both electrons in the bond to the more electronegative atom. Let's start with H2S. In H2S, the sulfur is more electronegative than the hydrogens. So to think about assigning oxidation number, we're going to give all of those bonding electrons to the sulfur. This is going to leave the hydrogens with a charge of plus one each, and this means that the oxidation number of hydrogen in this compound is plus one. Each of the hydrogens is plus one. For the sulfur, well, we could think about those bonding electrons headed to the sulfur, and notice that this is going to leave the sulfur with a charge of negative two, or we could notice that the molecule overall is neutral, no plus or minus in the molecular formula. And so the, the oxidation number of sulfur must balance the oxidation numbers of the hydrogens. Therefore, it must be negative two. And this is very typical for sulfur in covalent compounds like H2S. What about sulfite in B? Well, let's start with the oxygens. Oxygen is more electronegative than sulfur, and we can apply a rule that we saw in the previous video or this idea of giving all the bonding electrons to the oxygens to recognize that oxygen is going to end up with a formal charge of negative two, and so its oxidation number is negative two for the doubly bonded, initially formally neutral oxygen. In fact, the other two oxygens also have oxidation numbers of negative two. To see this, we need to notice that they've got a formal charge of negative one as it is, and breaking the SO bonds towards these oxygens would add another negative charge so that the total negative charge after breaking the bonds is negative two. The oxidation numbers of the oxygens down here are also negative two. Now here, it is a useful exercise to think about the sulfur's formal charge after breaking all the bonds as we've been thinking about, but we could also apply the idea that sulfite as a whole has a charge of negative two, and we've accounted for negative six with the oxygens, and so we need to balance that back up to a net charge of negative two, and to do that, the sulfur would need an oxidation number of positive four. So this is a sulfur four situation with sulfur in the plus four oxidation state. Now what about C? 
sodium sulfate. Well, in the Na pluses, this might be the easiest one of them all. This applies an important idea that in a monatomic ion, the charge of the ion is the oxidation number. The oxidation number is the charge. So Na plus with a charge of plus one, the Na is in the plus one oxidation state. It's that simple. In sulfate, in the sulfate anion, each of the oxygens is negative two for the same reason we just went through with sulfite, actually exact same reasoning for the neutral and anionic oxygens. And here now, because the charge is negative two in the ion as a whole, in order to balance six of those negative charges, six of the eight negative charges on the oxygens, sulfur needs to be in the positive six oxidation state. So this is actually an interesting thing to notice that sulfite, the sulfur in sulfite is sulfur four, while the sulfur in sulfate is sulfur six. This leads to a big difference in the acidity of H2SO4 versus H2SO3. H2SO4 is a strong acid, H2SO3 a much weaker acid. Quite often in this chapter, you'll be asked to balance redox reactions occurring in aqueous solution in the presence of either acid or base. And you may see the acid listed as H3O+, although in an electrochemistry context, it's very common to just keep things simple and list the acid as H+. And when we're dealing with a basic solution, you'll see hydroxide among the reactants or products. And there's sort of a method to balancing redox reactions in aqueous, acidic, or basic solutions. We're gonna go through those on this slide in the next. So if we're thinking about acidic solutions, the first thing we're gonna to wanna to do is write the two so-called half reactions representing the redox processes. Now we haven't talked yet about what a half reaction is. A half reaction is a pure oxidation or reduction process with with electrons either as a product or a reactant, respectively. So I'm going to go back to this example of sodium metal reacting with chlorine gas to produce NaCl. We could write a half reaction for the oxidation of the sodium metal as follows. Sodium solid goes to sodium cation and an electron. That's an oxidation process because an electron is lost from the sodium solid. Loss of electrons is oxidation. We could also write a reduction half reaction for the chlorine gas. Cl2 adds two electrons to produce two Cl minus. And this half reaction is a reduction since two electrons are being accepted by the Cl2 or gained by the Cl2 to produce Cl minus and gain of electrons is reduction. So each of these is a half reaction. And the key to a half reaction is that electrons appear either as a product in the case of oxidation or a reactant in the case of reduction. All right, so the first thing we need is those two half reactions. And we can find these often by analyzing the oxidation numbers of the reactants and products. From there, we're gonna balance all elements except hydrogen and oxygen. And it's oxygen and hydrogen that often make this balancing process complicated. We can balance on oxygen by adding water molecules to one side or the other. And then we can balance hydrogen by adding H plus ions to one side or the other to sort of compensate for the H's we added with H2O in step three. We can balance charge then by adding electrons we introduce positive charge in step four, and we can balance that with negative charge from electrons in step five. And then we wanna scale the half reactions to ensure that each of these has equal numbers of electrons. That way the electrons lost in the oxidation is equal to the number of electrons gained in the reduction. And then finally, we're gonna add the balanced half reactions together. This will cause a cancellation of the electrons on the reactant and product sides so that electrons will drop out of the balanced equation. And we simplify further by removing species that appear on both sides. So for example, we might have waters on both sides or protons on both sides, and we can simplify those down by subtracting things out. I should add really quickly here that in steps two through four, two through five, sorry, in these steps, these are gonna involve both 
half reactions. We're going to do this for both half reactions. This won't always be necessary for both half reactions. Sometimes it's only necessary for one of the two, for instance, but you want to consider this in both half reactions. And this is the overall process. So in broad brush strokes, we need those half reactions first, and then we balance on all elements except oxygen and hydrogen. A good example of that is the Cl2 to 2Cl oxidation reaction, where we need two Cl minuses on the product side to balance the Cl2 on the reactant side. Once we've done that, well, then we look at oxygen and add water molecules to balance on oxygen. We balance on hydrogen, adding H pluses, balance charge by adding electrons, then we scale the half reactions to ensure the electrons transferred are equal, add the balanced half reactions together, and essentially subtract out things that appear on both sides of the equation, which will always include electrons and may include waters, protons, or other species that the two half reactions happen to have in common. In basic aqueous solutions, in redox reactions occurring in basic aqueous solutions, we'll often have H2O and OH- as reactants or products. And my strategy for balancing in basic solutions is basically to take everything we just learned from the previous slide, that acid process, and essentially cancel out or remove the H pluses by adding hydroxide to both sides. So step one here is essentially everything that we saw on the previous slide. Balance as if the reaction is taking place in acid. Once we've done that, we're going to have some H pluses either on the reactant or product side, and we're going to add enough hydroxide ions to neutralize, essentially, the H plus ions. So the number of hydroxides we're going to add to both sides will be equal to the number of H plus ions that we see on one side or the other. This is going to produce H2Os where that H plus was located and excess hydroxide on the other side of the equation where there was no H plus. And so step three, then we're going to combine those H pluses and OH minuses, those ions to make water molecules. And then this may leave us with some redundant water molecules on both the reactant and product sides. We can essentially subtract those out, drop them out of the equation to produce the simplest final version. And we've produced the reaction occurring in basic aqueous solution. So the broad idea here is start by balancing as if the reaction is taking place in an acidic solution, add the appropriate number of hydroxides and combine to create water molecules, and then drop out any water molecules that appear on both the reactant and product sides.